Hello, my name is Mike Driscoll, and I'm going to talk about the Funk Tools module, which is part of Python's standard library. Let's check it out. So what is Funk Tools anyway? It's kind of a funny named module. Well, it is a module for, that you can use uh, for higher order functions. What that means is that the functions act on or return other functions. In general, any callable object can be treated as a function for the purposes of this module. This description of func tools comes from Python's doc documentation. What this basically means is that the modules or submodules, however you want to look at it, within the func tools module can be applied to other functions or classes using a decorator or as a decorator. In this particular um, tutorial, we are going to cover these pieces of the func tools module. There are several caching functions. There's one called total ordering, partial, reduce, single dispatch, and wraps. Caching. Um, LRU cache, the one at the bottom, has been around the longest and has been in Python for a, quite a while. There's also a new cache, which is kind of a lightweight version of LRU cache, and was included in Python 3.9, which is the current version at the time of recording. And then, of course, you have cache property, which basically lets you uh, create a property in a class and make it so it's able to cache stuff in it. We're really only going to focus on cache and LRU cache in this particular video. So, functools.cache is a simple, lightweight, unbounded function cache, sometimes called memoize. I'm actually not sure how you pronounce that, but that's how I'm going to pronounce it in this video. It will return the same as LRU cache with a max size is set to none, which basically creates a thin wrapper around a dictionary lookup for the function's arguments. Because it never evicts or, or removes old values, this is smaller and faster than LRU cache with a size limit. You can go look at the source code to try to figure out why this would be. Um, so I'm just going to grab a docu some documentation from, or an example from the Python docs of the cache how you might use this module. Um, I really couldn't find any information about why you would use cache versus LRU cache. So you just have to kind of like look for yourself. But this is a, this is a pretty common example in Python tutorials is to use a factorial and show that, well, one, to show you, um, you know, factorials in Python. But another reason that people like to use it is that it is a good um, recursion example. Now here we're going to use uh, cache, and we're just going to call this multiple times. And each time you call it, it should like cache the result. Now if my understanding is correct, when you ca call factorial 15, it should have cached all the calls up till 10. So this one should be significantly faster than 10 was because the first 10 calls are already cached. I can't actually run this in this particular example because my uh, Jupyter Notebook is running 3.8. And this particular uh, example would only run in 3.9. But give it a try, and you could uh, try timing it using Python's time module to see how quickly it is when it comes to calling factorial with uh, 15. All right, let's go ahead and move on to LRU cache. So I like to use an example that is kind of a real world example. So in my case, I want to download a web page. And I might want to download the web page multiple times. So if I downloaded the web page once in the morning and then I want to download it again in the afternoon, to save bandwidth, you can use LRU cache and have it cache the, like, the last 24 uh, calls to the function, which is what I'm doing here. Max size equals 24. You can set this to any value that you want, but I wouldn't make it too big because then you're just going to have all this stuff in your memory. So you know, keep that in mind when you're when you're caching because you you can theoretically run out of memory on your computer. All right. So what this does is it goes to Python's web page, and it's going to insert the module into the into the URL. Then we'll do request.read and return what that what that gets you, which should be the HTML of the page. So if we go to this page, which I've already ran once. Um, it's going to loop over these modules, Fung Tools, OS, Sys, and OS, and it'll take the start time and the end time and subtract them here. And then what this tells us is that as it downloads, 
Each of these downloads in less than a second, but you'll notice that when you download the OS module the second time, it's like pre pretty much instantaneous. Um, not even a tenth of a second or a twentieth of a second. It's like crazy, crazy fast. So that shows you that it's been cached and is accessing it from memory or even disk much faster than it would have had to download it again. So this is a really quick way to do, add caching to your Python program. All right, let's move on to functools.totalordering. This is an interesting um, decorator that you use on classes. So when you want to create a class and you want it to be able to do comparisons, like one instance of a class and another instance of a class, is it less than or equal to? Is it greater than or equal to? Or do they just equal each other? That sort of thing. When you want to do that, you have to um, override these dunder methods here. LT for less than, less than or equals, greater than, greater than or equals, or just the equality um, uh, dunder methods. If you, that means you have to basically define five methods, possibly even six if you want to do not equals, and you want not equals to do something different than it normally would. Um, if you don't, if you're feeling lazy or you're under a time constraint, and you just like prototyping. Funk tools that total ordering will help you out because it simplifies the effort of creating one of these kind of classes by the fact that you can just create a class that defines one of these first four less than, less than or equal, great th greater than, and greater than or equal. You can define one of these and the equality one and then apply this uh, decorator and it will define the rest for you uh, programmatically. Let's take a look at an, exa at an example. So here I have a class that I've run once. I implemented less than and I grabbed an equality one and we're just setting these values to not equal, even though normally you would set it to equal. Just to make this example more fun, I, I found an example where they, they reversed what it should do. So if you run this code and try to print out all these different functions, you're going to see that three of them are not implemented because I never overrode those dunder methods up here in the class. Um, less than is implemented, so it returns true. And then, of course, we also did uh, equals, so that one returns true. And then you have false at the end. If you want to, you can go ahead and add the total ordering to your class. So from func tools, import total ordering, apply it as a decorator. Same exact code, but when you run it, all of the comparison operators work now. You've got true, true, false, false, true, false. And so that's just a really nice, easy shortcut that you could do to make your class writing quicker and your prototyping faster. All right, let's go ahead and move on and learn about partial functions. Now, a partial function is used for creating new functions with some defaults applied, like, almost like a lambda in a way. Um, I'm including a link in, in my presentation so you can jump right on over to one of my articles on partial functions, but I'll also include it in the description of this video. Okay. So to use it, you do from func tools import partial, or you could just import func tools and do func tools dot partial, however you want. In this case, you don't, you don't need to use it as a decorator. You just do partial, the name of the function, and whatever arguments you want to add to it. Now you could apply all of the arguments, but in this case, I'm just going to make a special function called pAd that is a variation of add, and it always defaults a to four. So when I run this, um, p add 10, it should return 4 plus 10 is 14. Let's see if that works. Yes, it does. So let's change it to 15. Now we get 19 as output. You know, you can change this to whatever you want. And basically what this is doing is it's creating a new function based on the function that you've got up here, but you've actually defaulted one or more of the arguments and keyword arguments in the, in the function. This is especially useful uh, for callbacks. Like if you were using it in WX Python or tkinter, which are Python GUI frameworks, you might want to pass an extra argument to the event handler so to do something. So uh, here's a tkinter example. Um, create your create your machine create your your um, root object in tkinter. Give it a title. Set set the size of your frame basically. 
Here it is using a lambda. So lambda, you want to call your button event, which is another function, and you want to pass it a value on through. So we'll pass press me in. That's the, that's the text that we're using down here in the actual button. So when the button is clicked, you will actually be able to pass something along to the event handler. This can be really useful, like if you need to need to do, like pass an object along that can be mapped to that particular button press. So if you have the button object, you could you could create like a dictionary that says, you know, button object colon call a special function, and you can kind of pass that around and do you can do just do all kinds of cool things by passing that along. Let's look at how you might do that with partial though. So we just take the same idea, and here we have partial, and we pass the function in and then whatever values you want to pass along to it. So I mean it's very similar, but you can cut me, you know, as you saw with the previous example with add, you could actually modify this function so that it could pass one or more items. Whereas lambda, it's a little bit more difficult and a little bit harder to read in my opinion. So go ahead and play around with that kind of thing. So way back in Python 2, uh, reduce was a part, was a keyword in Python. In Python 3, reduce was removed as a keyword, but put in defunct tools. Um, reduce is handy. It reduces, it'll apply a function on two arguments cumulatively for the, to the items of the iterable from left to right. Um, it basically is kind of a way to code, code fold. Um, and real Python actually has a really good article on it that I recommend you go check out. But I also included a link for uh, the documentation. Um, let's look at a quick example. So here we have the add function again. In this case, we're going to create the add function and we're going to pass it a list of one through five. What this will do is reduce, we'll call it, and basically do one plus two plus three plus four plus four plus five over and over again until you get the result, which is 15. So it's basically calling this cumulatively. So what I think it's doing is it takes uh, the first two, which returns, uh, you know, three. Then it takes three plus three is six. Six plus four is five, is ten, and then ten plus five is fifteen. That's what I believe it is doing. It kind of folds it all down for you, and just gives you the end result. Um, I have almost never used reduce. In fact, I don't. I can't recall a time when I had to use it for anything in my own uh, professional life. But people who are used to doing uh, functional programming use uh, this kind of functionality a lot. Um, I know this was uh, was removed because uh, list comprehensions were added to Python, and you can do much of the same things with list comprehensions that you do with reduce, and even the map function in Python. So, you know, if, depending on which one you find more readable, you might choose reduce versus a list comprehension, or vice versa. All right, let's talk about function overloading. Python really doesn't have a lot of capabilities when it comes to function overloading. It didn't have it at all, really, in Python 2. But Python 3 added uh, a type of function overloading with single dispatch, which is part of the func tools module. Um, the idea behind function overloading is that it's a generic function composed of multiple functions implementing the same operation, but for different types. Which implementation should be used during a call is determined by the dispatch algorithm. Python itself only su supports dispatching based on the type of the first argument of a function. So if you're used to C++, where you can do dispatching based on the types of multiple arguments in a function, uh, that just won't work in Python. It only works you know, using the type of the first argument. So let's take a look at how this works single dispatch. So, to use this, it's a decorator. So we'll add it to our function. We'll do add to single dispatch. We'll slap it on our add function. But in this case, we're going to say it's not implemented because we actually don't call this function directly. It seems kind of weird, but that, that's just how it works. Then, to uh, create another add uh, function, uh, you call it, you name it with an underscore, but you register it as int. So what that does is if you call add with an integer as the first argument, it is going to call this function right here because it has been registered as taking only, only integers, so to speak. At least integers is the first argument. 
I went ahead and did an add with string and list too because these are, these different types can can technically add other items to them. So let's see what happens when we call this. Um, if we run this code, oh, I need to make this a little bit smaller. You can see the first argument is type int when I call it with one and two, and so it returns three. Then the next one, I pass in two strings and it adds them together and you end up with Python programming, no space. Finally, you have uh, a class list. And so I'm adding these two shorter lists to create a bigger list, basically. And so that's, that's kind of how you would use that. I haven't really used this particular functionality in Python all that much, but recently I've been doing some conversions of code where I want to convert between a, a dictionary and a, and, a con and a class object. And I could see where this would be really useful because I could say, you know, register that I want to work on dictionaries one way and I want to work with objects in a different way. And that might be a really cool way to use single dispatch in my, in my particular use case. All right, the last uh, part of wraps that I want to talk about is functools.wraps. I actually covered this in one of my own articles on mouse versus Python. So we, wraps is used with decorators. So we should step back and take a look at a decorator so we kind of understand what's going on first. So first of all, we have a decorator. I just called it my decorator. Inside of a decorator, you have another function, which is what does the magic. Um, I'm just going to make it log out the arguments and keyword arguments, as well as the result of the function that is decorated. These will just print a standard out, and we'll have them handy in case we want to use them. So that's what that looks like. Now to apply the decorator, you just do at my decorator, and we'll put it back on our add function, so that when I run this, it's going to log all that output out, but it's also going to do something kind of weird. So let's see what it does here. So we run it, we get our little log output here, but you notice the name of the function is wrapper and the doc string is a decorator. That doesn't look right. Let's try running it without the decorator. So if you run it without the decorator, you can see that the name of the function is actually add and the doc string, it matches what I put as the doc string up here. So with the decorator applied, it's renaming stuff. Um, let's go back one. Okay, well here's the here's where it's getting that. It's grabbing the wrapper name and the doc string from the from the wrapper itself. That's not really what you want in um, your code. So let's find out how you can fix that with functools.wraps. So let's go back to our decorator code. We'll import wraps, and wraps is itself a decorator. So we wrap it. We wrap the function that we're passing in with wraps, and that should fix the problem. So if we run this code and then go back and rerun the code from before, now we're getting the logged output, and we're also getting the correct name of the function and the correct doc string as well. Now, why would you do this? Does it really matter that much? Um, I actually asked about this on Twitter recently. I think it was actually last year, so it wasn't that recently. But I found out that um, with like PyTest and unit test, I think PyTest especially, if you're if you're using decorators in your tests, it can really script the test because the test is looking at the test name. And if it's not returning the actual test name, but it's returning the wrapper name instead, then the test will have, throw really strange errors that are hard to debug because the testing framework is trying to figure out um, which test to run and it's getting back these weird generic names instead of the actual test name. So that's something to keep in mind that test harnesses may not work quite right if you wrap them with a decorator and you don't use functools.wraps to maintain the name of the, de of the actual decorated function. All right, so that's all I have for the functools module right now. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. Otherwise, I'll see you guys next time.